You do not want a great introduction to improvisation because you may have absolutely nothing to offer. I was born in Brixham, which is a fishing town. When I was a child, you got out the house. First of all, you played around the harbour because it was a little fishing town, very poor because the fish had all died. Then as you got, up, when you got maybe six or seven years old, you would go further away from the harbour. At about seven or eight, you made the cliffs. I decided when I was just before my ninth birthday not to believe anything the grown-ups said. And the next day, I decided to always see if the opposite could be true. I think it changed my life. I've been doing it ever since. And it taught me to be looking for the obvious and not the clever. The obvious is really your true self. The clever is that an imitation of somebody else, really. And I was so pleased to be born in that place because it was beautiful. I was a total misfit as a teacher. They should have got rid of me. I only stayed because they inspected the school and found my class were doing excellent work. But don't think they like me for that. I wrote out a list of all the things my teachers stopped me from doing. And I started teaching those. And as my teachers hated spontaneity, it was like a very good syllabus. I remember making faces was at the top. <laughs> uh, making faces turned out to be really important, very useful game. In my opinion, many professors don't really want you to learn. They want to look like good professors. They teach you not to like failure. I'm sure they did. But you can't learn anything without failing. So they had the teacher teach you a different attitude towards failure. They teach you to hate it. No, <laughs> you're failing. It means you, we can now teach you because you failed. You can't learn anything without failing. Therefore, we have to change your attitude to failure. Any idea will do if it inspires the person, but most people cling to ideas because they've been through this stupid training of being searching for the best idea. In fact, you learned at school to tent yourself up and go, ah, I'd, I'd do better. Give me another chance. You just fill yourself with tension and that causes fear. And in my opinion, doing your best is the same as stage fright. There's this terrible culture in which everyone's taught to do their best. Then to see a mime class. And the teacher was cross. He said, no, no, no. And you look as if you're walking in deep sand. <laughs> I thought, why don't you say, hey, hey, fantastic. You discovered the mime for walking in deep sand. It would be just the same. And it wouldn't be so negative. I was so naive. I thought actors yeah. weren't afraid of the audience. All actors are afraid. I didn't understand that. That's why they don't look like people. I don't want to see all these frightened people on the stage. Normal acting does not deal with fear. You're supposed to hide it. It's like that Swedish guy who said that uh, he was, he'd always known he was scared, but he didn't know the others were equally scared until I arrived and started exploring the fear. You can't teach spontaneity, but you can get people to not do the things that stop them being spontaneous. Spontaneity, you don't teach spontaneity, you remove the obstacles. And of course, the main obstacle is you, your social self, which is so concerned with being approved of and liked and all the rest of that. And it screws you up. Action is so simple, you can't grasp it. It's one person is changed by another. That's it. Wonderful actors make wonderful changes profound changes. And the great playwrights make profound and wonderful changes. But it's so simple. How could one not see that? When I began to teach improvisation, I was astounded at all the things the improvisers did to, to wreck themselves. Because they were so negative and they can't, if they lit a fire, 
it would start to rain. That's a problem of people wanting to be original, so they reject what their mind gives them because they've seen it before and they've been taught not to cheat. You can't cheat an improvisation. There are no new ideas if you've been long enough. <laughs> if it's obvious, people will like it. We've been trained the opposite. We've been trained that we're not good enough and we have to do extra stuff. By ourselves, we're not innately worth anything. So you use more effort. You can be a wonderful improviser, but you'd be better if you used less effort. Well, it's improvisers have an inhibition about it because they don't want to all be altered. I teach people to be boring, but not depressed. People are, well, I do see when people have interviewed me, they often talk as if I didn't want the scene to be funny. But if they take my advice, they'd be a hell of a lot funnier. You have to teach improvisers to think inside the box, or you can't work with them. You say to the mask actor, you say, make your mask fit the mask, the thing in the mirror is going to find a sound. <laughs> and I said the thing in the mirror would make a sound. I haven't said you make a sound. That's devious. Once you're an experienced improviser, it's ridiculous not to kill ideas because some ideas deserve a quick death. If you didn't kill any ideas, it would all be like deflated sex dolls or Salvador Dali clocks. It would, there'd be no guts to anything. I think we'd limp and pathetic. Because you'd have no resistance. Of course you had to kill ideas. and All the things we say you shouldn't do when you start, in the end, of course you can do for pleasure, and, but not from fear. The thing about improvisation, if, it, if it's not risky, it's not worth doing. Keith, what? What makes a good improviser? Uh, generosity and no fear. The audience connects things, but the improvisers disconnect because they've been taught to be original. But the real knowledge is in the audience. They know when to laugh, they know when to pay attention. If you direct a play, if you're not an idiot, when you get the audience and you watch the audience, because you're only guessing, the audience know when it's good and bad. But the idea that the audience might educate us instead of us with the knowledge educating the audience was some sort of heresy and anathema. The audience wants to connect everything. The improvisers want to disconnect everything. So now you teach it and people think, oh, there, of course. <laughs> it took years to find that. Who wants to be 90? I don't know. Anybody who's 89. Well, the future's going to change us. It certainly changed me for the worse. Oh. Well, this feeling I'm going to wake up one day in a strange place. And they say, ah, oh, you've arrived. Mr. Johnstone, we've arrived. Quick, quick, you're just in time for this theater sports festival. We're going to be a break in 10,000 years. And then I'll know <laughs> I've gone to hell. Laughter should not be the measure of all things. Is did you relate to somebody? Did you inspire the people on the stage with you? Did you go on a journey into somebody that we haven't been before? Do you have advice for the next generation of improvisers? Oh my God. Please, please try and be truthful and good natured for God's sake. And stop being so damn competitive. Be average, please, please. Because I want your best work and I can't get your best work and you try and do your best. Try and, try and do anything wonderfully well. Go out and watch the sunset and write a great poem about it. No, go and write an average poem about it and you have some hope of getting something good. Mm. There's no hope in doing your best, it's a disaster. <laughs>